The Grell first appeared in White Dwarf magazine issue 12, published by Games Workshop in May 1979, and the very same issue that saw the arrival of the Gith Yankee and the Hook Horror. Grells were created directly by Ian Livingstone, editor of the magazine, and yes, that is the same Games Workshop that created Warhammer 40,000. Once long ago, TSR and Games Workshop were best friends. Perhaps in a parallel dimension, they still are. The most lasting legacy Games Workshop left for Dungeons and Dragons was the Fiend Folio that collected all of these nasty beasts into an official monster manual that was finally published in 1981 after some delays. Grell these days don't look like they were originally described. For example, they were supposed to be a drab olive green colour with streaks of white over a 5 foot diameter brain-like globular body that appeared to have a division down the middle with a wide eagle-like beak protruding out and 10 dark green tentacles attached to the bottom, each around 6 feet in length with retractable barbs, which is, if encountered in the darkness of a cavern or ruin, a pretty scary looking monster. That colour scheme really does blend into the background and makes a lot of sense for an ambush predator. But the original artwork for the Grells is in black and white line art, so people read the description as brain-like, and these days everyone paints Grells in shades of pinks and purples. Plus the artwork is much more actually brain-like, when originally they appeared more like globs and nodules than the folds and swirls of an actual brain. Also, the real brain of the Grell looks nothing like a humanoid brain, as we shall discover. There are quite a few misconceptions about these monsters, and I'm here to dive very deep into the lore, biology and societies of the Grells. My name is AJ Pickett, that is what I do. Also, this video is scripted with captions enabled so you can read along with me if you like, so grab yourself a tasty beverage. We're about to get deeply nerdy. Grells originated in the Far Realm. Most of them have the capability of crossing back over into the Far Realm without any problem. But the Far Realm is not a single location, it's the Far Realms. The near infinite spectrum of alternate realities where the laws of physics are so variant to what we consider normal for our reality that our forms of life just can't exist in those dimensions without getting seriously messed up. The Grell come from a specific collection of Far Realms that I sometimes refer to as the Flesh Dimensions, some of which are the internal pseudo-dimensions that work much like organs in our own bodies of tremendously weird and stupendously powerful beings called the Draden. So large and primal that they are sort of mired or stuck in amber, where instead of tree sap, the upstart primordials and gods built a clutter of reality around them and called it the Prime Material Plane. The Grell are so tiny compared to the size of the Draden that they are essentially nothing more than sapient bacteria existing within a reality where there are organs the size of planets, the flow of neural signals form rivers of lightning, there are floating oceans of organic fluids, great packs of roaming predators constantly on the hunt for the herds of teeming parasites and other more insidious pathogens. The Grells are a little bit infection, a little bit cancer, and a little bit gout or kidney stones. They also mess with the nerve signals of the Draden to mask their presence and cause painful ossification by building crystalline obstructions which keep the predatory immune ecosystem from devouring them, just as they consume the endless flesh around them. It is very freaky, weird, frightening, and horrific as an environment compounded by the fact that it is also teeming with other pathogens which will quickly overcome any pathetically undefended life form from the prime material plane that accidentally plunges through some random portal into this nightmare. The Grells find the stark, sterile environment of the prime material plane poses its own problems, but they have adapted to it very well. Is this the canon, official version of where they come from? No. There's no detail on that officially, but the Drayton are referenced in other sources. The adaptations and features of the Grell fit that sort of situation like a glove, and how they operate in the Prime Material Plane makes a lot more sense when you think about them in terms of giant infectious microorganisms. It also gives some insight as to how the Far Realm is so often linked to psychic power, tentacles, mutations, and themes of body horror like infections and loss of control over one's own flesh and blood, and of course, actual psychosis, losing a mental grip on reality entirely. We don't know how the primal Grells inside their own nightmare dimension operate, but we do know a lot about those which originally crossed over into the Prime Material Plane and why they first crossed over. And for this, we need to take a wild ride into Spelljammer. Spacefaring, or colonial as in colony Grell, travel in strange ships made out of a type of translucent crystal that they use for all their building materials. 
They don't typically build anything wide scale if living on a planet. They just take advantage of natural caverns, ruins and abandoned or stolen lairs of other large creatures. But in wild space, within crystal spheres and out in the rainbow phlogist and ether, they need to make use of ships to get around. But their methods of propulsion are entirely different from any other spell jammer vessels. In wild space, Grail ships do not spell jam so much as submerge into the far realm and then surface again in space, traveling underneath space using some bizarre dimensional passage that the largest and most powerful Grail, known as the Patriarch, generates. When outside of a crystal sphere in the gaseous phlogiston flow, the front end of the ship opens, exposing a hollow tube that runs the length of the vessel. The Grail ship then ignites the inrushing phlogiston gas, ejecting the exhaust gases from its rear in a motion similar to that of a squid, or really, a phlogiston ramjet engine. The 30 foot wide spell jamming Praetriarch controls the size of the phlogiston burn and thus the speed of the ship, and that speed can reach tremendous levels as the ship crams more and more gas in the front the faster it goes. It's just a matter of not burning the entire crew alive and exploding the central tube apart with the force of the immolation. But the massive Grail Patriarch has those extra dimensional warp powers that allow additional venting of heat and force. The benefit is that Grail don't rely on magic to get around the prime material plane and the colonial Grail are indeed a true pan-dimensional species. Unfortunately, it's not thanks to them being enlightened benevolent super beings. Far, far from it. They operate like a swarm, consuming as they go, leaving devastation in their wake. The prime material plane is stupendously big. They can keep up this sort of behavior forever. And they plan to. From the colonial Grail's point of view, they are a perfect life form. Everything that gets eaten is a lesser life form. Everything that turns around and eats them instead is also a perfect life form. And they see life pretty much simply as a matter of eat or be eaten. They exist to eat, reproduce and eat more until they die and stop existing that's it. Physically, all Grail are very much the same. They differ in size and intelligence and have loose divisions in a social caste pyramid based on their size, cunning and hunting ability. All Grail prefer to hunt and kill their own food. There are some exceptions, but even the Patriarch hunts for its own food, even if it can just take food from any of its underlings whenever it wants to. Grail do keep live food stock when needed and as emergency rations for the colony, but they don't keep them as livestock for breeding and so on. If an area runs out of food, they move on to an uh, area with better hunting. Grail start life as eggs laid in sticky clusters adhered to some surface in a reasonably secure location underground. They're small when they hatch, about fist sized, and are not sapient, with the intelligence of something like a house cat. The two dozen hatchlings disperse and fend for themselves immediately. A Grail hatchling is tiny, Grail juvenile is small, and they're not born with any gender characteristics. They grow these organs as required when they reach adult size, but more on that later. They exist for years as vermin-like hunters, feeding on small rodents, insects, and reptiles. By the time they are five, they're about half the size of an adult, have gained self-awareness, and are taking on prey as large as most medium-sized humanoids. Young Grell spawned near colonies normally begin to join their kind around this age and reach their full growth at about 10 years of age. But all Grell continue to grow through their lifetimes and the oldest Grell are significantly larger and more powerful than the younger ones. The colonies are structured according to size, power and dominance. The largest Grell is known as the Patriarch. Next in the social hierarchy are the Philosophers and the rest are basically soldiers. There is a lot of blur around these roles though. It's Risky for Colony Grail to grow too large and the Patriarch of a Grail Colony destroys and consumes any potential rivals long before they become powerful enough to challenge it. Grail that anticipate this danger abandon the colony to continue their existence as feral Grail, growing larger and stronger far from the suspicions of a Patriarch. Only when the exile feels that it is strong enough to mount a challenge to the Patriarch does it return. The terminology to describe this social strata and behaviour is better described as top, versatile and bottom grill. Their psychology is anything but empathetic though, so it's more a gauge of how systemizing the grill is. About one in five grill has inherent extreme systemizing traits. They are dominant and far far more focused on pragmatic action and control over the colony, including the drive to increase the size of the colony. In earlier sources this was referenced to those grill having a male gender, hence the term patriarch for the most dominant grill. The versatile Grell are typically philosophers, they are much less likely to go off on their own as feral Grell, and their philosophy is a blend of systemizing and empathizing, when it, which can be expressed as what's good for me is good for the colony. 
They focus on developing their intelligence, studying the arcane arts and rediscovery of Grell technology. As Grell become older and larger, their bodies start to ossify. They don't have a skeleton and bones. Their beak is actually more like the shell of a mollusk. Their body tissue is fibrous. These fibers get more and more shell-like growth on them, which makes the Grell tougher, but also slows them down. And after about 200 years of good health, they will undergo a fairly rapid degeneration, failing quickly in five or 10 years after reaching their maximum growth. Older Grell become painfully afflicted as their body tissues become dead and rigid. Finally, they lose the ability to feed themselves and digest their meals. Few Grell live beyond 230 years old. To compensate, Grell versatiles tend to study magic and construct technological devices in the form of lightning lances, tip spears, and will fortify the colony by use of Grell crystal structures. This is all motivated by self-interest mostly, but they are systemizing enough to arm other Grell with these devices and also pass on arcane knowledge because a stronger Grell colony is a more secure lair for them. Also, as they work hard on making weapons and such, they will demand underlings fetch them food, so they're not distracted by having to go hunting all the time. Hence why Grell colonies often end up keeping pens of miserable victims who are just waiting in darkness and squalor before they get taken and eaten. Some truly wretched victims will try to preserve their life as long as possible by working for the Grell, not just grabbing other victims and shoving them forward, but to the point of actually going out and finding more victims for the Grell hunters. If they fail, they are on the menu, so be very wary of lost individuals in the Underdark who try to lead you somewhere. They may be leading you directly into a deadly ambush. Grell soldiers are essentially the bottom Grell. They're motivated mainly by self-interest, gravitating toward the colony for the greater protection in numbers, the chance of being handed weapons to use, and even of learning arcane powers, which is very handy in the hunting efforts. The Grell Patriarch determines when the number of Grell have become too low, at which point he will select another Grell and mate with it. The majority of Grell are produced this way, but their exact reproductive method is a mystery. When examined, dead Grell don't have any gender traits or seem to have any reproductive organs, so it may be that they only grow these as needed and the rest of the time Grell are physically asexual. In colony Grell ships, there is one Patriarch, a number of philosophers, and they are in charge of a larger number of soldiers. Only the Patriarch has the power to submerge the ship into the bizarre dimensional passages using the momentum of Phlogis and Ramjet propulsion to pick up speed before going in their nightmarish form of warp drive. Grail colonial ships appear to be gold in colour, and when they all move together they refer to them as the Legion of Gold. There is a mysterious sort of super Patriarch who is behind this unified colonial fleet known as the Imperator. Not much is known about the Imperator or how they manage to control all the other patriarchs, but it probably has to do with divine magic. Grell don't, as a general rule, venerate anything. They consider gods to just be really good at eating and really good at magic. But this is not always the case. There are some very rare Grell clerics, and they act more like warlocks, though. Instead of worshipping gods, they will sacrifice victims to that god as payment for the powers that god gives them. So it's an arrangement where they give food and the god gives them back the means to be better hunters. So this makes sense to the Grell. Grell are slightly less likely to become warlocks. First, they don't give a damn if souls are real or not, and pay almost no attention to the outer planes aside from how they can be manipulated by the arcane arts. Second, they don't give up power to anything or anyone. I don't think Grells care much what sort of power it is that they make these sort of arrangements with. It could be Mala, it could be Demogorgon. If it gets the results they want, that's all that matters to them. Grail physiology has a few things in common with beholders. They are naturally buoyant and move through the air using this flotation and the movement of their 10 long tentacles. This was originally described as type D flight, which means that they fly about as well as a sphinx. So it takes them two rounds to reach full airspeed and they take a couple of rounds to make a full turn, covering 60 feet of movement in the process. In 5th edition we ignore all that complexity, but it's kind of fun to play with the less agile flight capabilities of creatures in a sort of mobile combat and spelljammer. Anyway, if for some reason they lose the ability to fly, they can crawl along on their tentacles at 10 feet per round, but otherwise the typical speed they move during a combat encounter is 30 feet per round. Law-wise, their top speed is twice that, but they never get up to that speed in combat situations in any practical sense, so we just list it as 30 feet. The medium-sized Grell soldier has an armor class of 12, 10 d8 plus 10 or between 20 and 90 with an average of 55 hit points. The younger the growl, the fewer hit points it would have in that range. 
They have a plus two to initiative, plus six to stealth, and plus four to perception. They have no eyes, but see with sound and an electrical field sense that gives them blind sight within a 60 foot radius. Within that range, Grell can silently communicate with each other, just using alterations to their electrical field. Beyond that, they can also communicate with their own language of buzzing rasps, clicks, and whistles. They can also learn the language of other creatures, but they never bother learning to speak those languages. Due to the combination of electrical signals and sounds, they can only have very complex conversations while within 60 feet of each other. To quote the text from 3.5 edition's Lords of Madness sourcebook, while adventurers may mistake a grail's wrinkled grey hide for naked brain tissue, the monster is not in fact a disembodied brain. Its skin is damp and gleams wetly in poor light, but its epidermis is quite tough and leathery, measuring several inches thick on its upper body. The coloration varies from pale pink grey to a faint purple pink hue. Older grell are darker in colour than the younger grell. A grell's ten tentacles are rubbery and strong. Each is comprised of hundreds of ring-shaped muscles sheathed in a tough, almost fibrous hide that is much thinner than the thick, leathery epidermis of the main body. Sharp, bony barbs or needles stud each tentacle every two to three inches, almost to its very tip. These hollow barbs inject the growl's paralytic venom into its victims. The growl can partially retract its barbs in its tentacles to handle or manipulate objects it doesn't want to pierce or tear. Each tentacle is five to eight feet long, although large growl have longer tentacles. As mentioned, growl have no bones other than their beaks and their barbs. Their bodies are supported by flexible, soft cage work of cartilage beneath the thick epidermis. Although they don't enjoy doing it, most but the very oldest grell can easily squeeze through surprisingly small openings, compressing their bodies to about half their height or width with little trouble. The inner arrangement of a grell is quite unusual. The creature's brain is a bloated membrane that looks like a crumpled piece of paper. It's located above the beak near the front of the creature's body. Above the brain, at the top of the anterior portion of the body, lies a tangled mass of ganglia that serves as the center of the growl's electroreceptive sense. Its lungs are directly behind the brain, near the top center of the monster. The grell has no heart, but instead has 10 vascular chambers located in the body near the base of each tentacle. Constricting and relaxing in concert, these vascular chambers serve to circulate its green copper-based blood. The stomach is near the center of this mass and its digestive tracts fill the rear third of the body. Growl do not need to eat often and much prefer to feast on a large meal with long intervals in between than having to constantly hunt and eat smaller prey. An adult growl can easily devour an entire adult human, but afterward might not need to eat for up to three months. If food is plentiful or the opportunity presents itself, a growl does not hesitate to eat even if it's not particularly hungry. Growl will kill and eat for simple pleasure. They have no other games or pastimes. Their entire culture revolves around their ability to hunt, kill, and consume whatever they want. Several other alien species in media spring to mind when I think about comparisons to this sort of mentality. The predator aliens that have that trophy taking and uh, eat their prey, and of course the Herogen from Star Trek. While it is possible to knock out a growl's electromagnetic sense temporarily by a bolt of lightning, they suffer no permanent damage from it. It's just like someone shining a bright light in their eyes, interrupting their ability to see in the dark. They can be fully blinded if this is accompanied by an extremely loud noise, which also knocks out their hearing. Since their entire body is sensitive to vibrations, they have no way to protect their hearing. So lightning with a clap of thunder will render them temporarily blind and unable to communicate with each other. Growl hunting methods, while they are feral, are pretty simple and effective. They hover up above a good ambush spot and drop down on the target, lashing out with their barbed tentacles. In 5th edition, the typical growl is limited to two attacks, one with its tentacles and one with its beak. It is plus four to hit with a reach of 10 feet. Only targeting one creature, the tentacles strike for 1d10 plus two piercing damage and the victim must make a DC 11 constitution saving throw or become poisoned for one minute. While poisoned, the victim is also paralyzed, but can repeat the saving throw at the end of each of its turns, ending the effect on a success. The target is also grappled by the Grell with an escape DC of 15, but only if they are of the same size as the Grell or smaller. They will be restrained until this grapple ends by them breaking free or being released by the Grell. But while restrained, the Grell will have advantage on all attack rolls it makes against the victim, and when the Grell moves, it takes the grapple to target along with it. 
Because the Grail has a lot of spare tentacles, it can effectively see in all directions within 60 feet of itself, and it can attack other targets with its tentacles while it is grappling a victim. It just can't use the grapple attack on any other targets. The Grail can also attack an adjacent or grappled target with its beak, plus 4 to hit for 2d4 plus 2 piercing damage, but it normally reserves this for taking chunks out of grappled victims, striking with advantage, mainly because having its tentacles damaged is no great problem. It can regrow a tentacle fully within just one or two days, but getting its beak broken is a much more serious issue. With a strength of 15 and dexterity of 14, a Grail can use its tentacles to whip, trip and hurl targets. They have an intelligence of 12, so they can use complex and innovative combat techniques well above and beyond the basics listed in the monster stat block. Get creative. The Grail will investigate its ambush spot carefully and take full advantage of existing features like pit traps, unstable or difficult terrain that gives it a distinct advantage edge over adventurers incapable of flight like it has. Grail Philosophers are large in size, they are a higher challenge rating, so adjust their armor class, hit points, two hit bonus, uh, saving throw DCs and damage dice accordingly. They're also highly likely to be attacking in well coordinated groups, with the Philosopher directing the attacks and movements of a few soldier underlings. These will also be equipped with Grail weapons along with the soldiers. The Grail have four types of weapon they use. The tip spear is a razor sharp serrated punching dagger that fits snugly over the tip of a Grail tentacle. They use it like a dagger and it's capable of puncturing a target on a critical hit, restraining and paralyzing them just as effectively as their barbed venom thanks to the blade impaling them. They also make use of a metallic rod called a lightning lance which comes in a more common lesser variety and a very rare greater lightning lance. Each lance is made up of a silvery metallic substance. The lesser version is three feet long and weighs around two pounds, while the greater lances are five feet long and four pounds. The weapons can fire an electrical beam out to 60 feet. Those struck by a lesser lance take 3d6 lightning damage. Those hit by a greater lance take 5d6 lightning damage. Both weapons have five charges that replenish themselves over the next 24 hours once expended. All Grell have proficiency in the Lance's use, but to others it is alien technology requiring a DC 25 Arcana skill check just to activate it safely. What happens when that check is failed? If you are lucky, nothing happens. Or it may instantly release a beam of lightning and discharge the full damage into the person firing it. Grell are immune to electricity, so what do they care about how conductive it is? It might discharge all five shots at once and become inert for the next 24 hours. Or it might discharge and burn out, requiring full repair by a Grail Philosopher. Perhaps it explodes. Perhaps it drains all the electrical energy from the body of whoever is using it and they drop to the ground, making a death save immediately. Hopefully their body restarts after the lance effectively hits their off switch. Grell creates an alchemical powder that they fuse into lightweight translucent dirty grey crystal which they occasionally use to form the laboratory equipment needed to construct lightning lances, tip spears, they are also uh, known as silver spears, the Grell employ them against supernatural beings that are harmed by silver when available, and any other magical items that are very similar to the types humanoids use. Though due to Grell anatomy, shapes and amounts of items they can wear are unique to them, they can wear two amulets necklaces, periapts or brooches embedded in the thick hide of their body. They can wear up to two pairs of braces or bracelets on the thicker upper portions of two tentacles and they can wear up to four magical rings on the tips of four other tentacles. They can't make use of any headwear or eyewear or any clothing other than purpose-built Grell barding. This includes belts and cloaks. It is possible for the more advanced colonial Grell to make use of various types of Grell barding armour and in many cases the Grell do have some sort of ability to physically graft themselves into more complex and powerful items of the crystalline technology. The colonial Grell Patriarch's tentacles are merged into their Golden Crystal Legion ship when in flight. There is also this emergency combat transformation that the Patriarch can activate where the entire ship transforms into a sort of a crystalline Voltron giant humanoid construct with a huge lightning halberd weapon. I don't know why it's a humanoid shape but it's in the Spelljammer lore, so <laughs> there it is. To quote from Lords of Madness, Grell Alchemy combines the manipulation of arcane magic with the knowledge of natural science, chemistry, and most importantly, the physical laws and properties of the alien space from which the Grell originated. Obviously, not all of these properties can be easily replicated or manipulated in the Prime Material Plane, but Grell philosophers labor long and diligently to find ways to apply their knowledge of an alien sphere's magical and physical laws to the study of arcane matters in the human world. 
Few human scholars can begin to make heads or tails of Grell spellcasting and item creation simply because they have no knowledge of the alien properties embedded in Grell arcane lore. My suggestion is that player characters investigating Grell philosopher laboratory gear in a working state run a pretty strong risk of being exposed to the leaky radiations or worse yet, actually getting a good look into the Far Realm itself which runs the very real risk of mutation and or madness. At the very least, they will stagger away with one or two of their senses knocked out of action until they can get medical or magical treatment. At worst, they need to make a death saving throw or basically reincarnate on the spot into a monster. A Nothic is a good choice if you want to keep it simple, or perhaps they just get royally messed up and the rest of the party now has to fight a gibbering mouther while the player rolls up a new character. With great risk, so comes possible great reward. Perhaps the player character staggers away with an unlocked mind, now able to communicate via telepathy, or with an invisible daily use of the mage hand, cantrips as a spell like telekinetic power. Perhaps they suddenly know the strange formula for making Grail crystal powder, the shell of a cave fissure, some mercury, powdered pearl, basilisk tooth, and the sustained use of a witch bolt spell to fuse and shape the crystal growth. The Grail technology, their refuse littered lair, possible scavenger vermin infesting the trash that they just leave all over the ground, and the possible desperate captors they have locked away in dark, foul pens all make for dynamic Grail encounter areas. In particular, Grail philosophers may be lucky enough to have a captured wizard of some kind, torturing out arcane secrets to expand their knowledge of the specific magic of the strange prime material world that they've invaded. What would some sort of Grail Scout vessel look like if some colonial crystal ship was investigating a potential landing site? Would the Grail sit in the belly of some mobile humanoid golem? Krang from Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles certainly springs to mind. Far from a simple monstrous cave dwelling ambush predator, Grail have been known to make unusual alliances for their own reasons, such as in 1374 of the Day of Reckoning calendar in the vast swamp on the world of Toril where some adventurers were negotiating with the lizard folk cleric Kessisek, chieftain of the Sharptooth tribe, and they had to fight for their lives as the camp was attacked by seven shadow scale uh, lizard folk and a Grell, who sought to slay the new Sharptooth chieftain. Grell, as a rule, are insular and reclusive, so this was probably a tactical move to destabilize the lizard folk population. They pick off the survivors in their weakened state, and the Grell expand into the Great Swamp territory. By the way, that Grell descended out of fog, summoned by a magic. Grell typically shun sunlight, they just don't like it, and they tend to be much more numerous in the underdark regions of the Shadowfell, known as the Shadow Dark. This is where the most ancient, teeming populations of the original Grell invaders of the Prime Material Plane can be found. And that's about it from me today. Thanks for listening. Have fun introducing the horrors of the Grell to your players. And as always, I'll be back with more for you very soon. Mm -hmm.